Okay, uh, hello everyone. Hello, We're hello. And, uh, and we are going to win Pennsylvania. Okay, you just had the news there, I think. <laughs> We're going to win Pennsylvania. Well, <laughs> the news in the air is the United States election, and uh, I'm sure everyone's been, most people have been following it. And it's funny that um, non Americans, especially Nigerians, for instance, have also taken it very personal. You know, we followed the election so critically because lots of Nigerians are in the United States and indeed everywhere abroad. You know, we, we are scattered about in the whole world. And these are the, the migration issues that bother us a lot, make us interested in some of these activities that go on in, in other countries and how they are governed. And this is exactly what we're discussing today on this very, in this very webinar organized by the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Glasgow branch. My name is Emmanuel Salifu. I'm the publicity secretary of uh, Glasgow branch NSC. And I'd like to especially welcome you to this webinar session hosted by the branch. We have very wonderful talks uh, laid out for you today, two talks today. Uh, the, the speakers are vast, very, very uh, uh, vast professionals in their various fields, and they're going to do justice to it very shortly. So I'm not going to waste too much time in the introductions. I'll just go on to show you the lineup of programs for today and then introduce them quickly, and then we'll take the talk and have interactive sessions. But just some home uh, housekeeping before then. If you have any questions, any inquiry whatsoever, endeavor to use the chat box. The chat option is right there. Type in whatsoever you'd want us to know about, any question you'd have when the Q&A sessions come or even before then while the talk is going on. If you also want to ask at the branch for any information at all, you can use the chat option. Uh, please keep your microphones mute throughout the program, except if you are uh, asked to unmute yourself to, to speak. And this session should last maximum two hours so in between this time and endeavor to take a walk you know just stand up not a walk really just stand up and stretch yourself around and just uh, let your blood flow you know just uh, since we're getting used to the online life at this point right so the lineup of the program we have basically uh, we have a welcome address a welcome remarks very quickly delivered by our own chairman the chairman of the nsc glasgow branch dr olusion adediron Right after this program's parade, he would come up for the welcome remarks. And thereafter, I would introduce the first speaker for today, who would there, uh, then present her talk. And then we have some Q&A &A session on the talks she present, questions, interactions. And thereafter, I introduce the second speaker, who would also present his talk and have some interactions uh, right after that. And then we'll take some final remarks from the speakers and uh, some action points and comments from uh, other people and then we see how we can put all of these discussions into proper use there uh, after now and finally we'll have a word of thanks and uh, announcement and closing remarks right i now invite the chairman of the nigerian society of engineers glasgow branch dr olusio adediro to present his welcome remarks um thank you thank you very much uh, dr emmanuel salifu thank you for all the wonderful jobs you've been doing in the branch and thank for all the our executive putting this another webinar together all the effort goes to this even you will see that by the time we finish this webinar today and i just want to one, one welcome to everyone tonight you know as you are joining us this is glasgow Niger the nigeria society of engineer glasgow branch and what well, welcome to you, wherever you are connecting us from today, whether from possibly all, all over the globe, you are, you are, you are welcome yet tonight. We don't, we, we don't, we, we don't have more time to, you know, to, to, to spend on this, we, we, as uh, being said earlier on, it's been two different sessions, so I don't want too much time to do a lot of parade or any introduction. I can see different people from different corners of the NSC. You are all recognized, all the distinguished engineers among us, all our people from Glasgow, from different clubs, from different other professional organizations. You are welcome to NSC Glasgow brand. And I can assure you by the time we finish the first session, I'm sure you'll be looking forward even to the next one. And as you are sitting down to enjoy this, 
webinar with us tonight. And I hope you have a good time in this platform. I, I wish you all the best. And if there's any question about our branch, please send us an email or you can call me or call any of our executive. We are more than happy to answer you or give you, if you are interested in the slides after the webinar as well, please stick in your email as well. All the other announcements will come forward as, as we progress. It. Thanks so much and hopefully sit tight and enjoy this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another warm welcome to everyone from the NSA headquarters, NSA UK, NSA Europe, all over the place. You are very much recognized. So I'll move on now to introduce our guest speaker. The first speaker for today will be addressing the topic leveraging on common advantages of African migrants in conflict transformation. I'm sure most of us are hearing the word, the phrase conflict transformation probably for the first time. All of this would be done justice to very shortly. Our speaker today, Professor Alison Phipps, is a UNESCO chair in refugee integration through languages and arts at the University of Glasgow and professor of languages and intercultural studies. She is the Cal Distinguished Professor. She has the Decal Distinguished Professorship at the University of Otago and was distinguished visiting professor at the Waikato University Aotearoa. New Zealand from 2013 to 2016. She's a thinker in residence at the EU Hawke Centre, University of South Australia in 2016, and visiting professor at Auckland University of Technology. She was principal investigator for the two million pounds AHRC large grant, researching multilingually at the borders of language, the body, law, and the state. She's co-director of the 20 million pounds Global Challenge Research Fund, GCRF project on South-South Migration and Inequality. It's the world's largest migration research center. And she's also PI on a recent Arts and Humanities Award for two million pounds for cultural work in the Global South. In 2011, she was voted best college teacher by the student body and received the university's Teaching Excellence Award for a career distinguished by excellence. In 2012, she received an OBE for services to education and intercultural and interreligious relations in the, in the Queen's Birthday Honours. In 2019, she was awarded the Minerva Medal by the Royal Society of Philosophy. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the Royal Society of Arts, and of the Academy of Social Sciences. She has undertaken academic and artistic work in, amongst others, Palestine, Sudan, Altaria, New Zealand, Australia, Jamaica, Ethiopia, Germany, France, USA, Portugal, Ghana, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Argentina, and others. She has produced and directed theater and worked as dramaturg and creative liturgist with the World Council of Churches from 2008 to 2011, during the decade to overcome violence. Most recently, she co-directed Broken World, Broken Word, and Ged Gem Kuchri Kuku with Noyam African Dance Institute, Dodoa, Ghana, with Awona Sitole and Yameli Tozdro. Right, forgive me for all this mispronunciations. <laughs> She's reg she regularly advises public, governmental, and third sector bodies on migration, arts, and languages policy, and including co-leading a witness-bearing visit to Calais for the Scottish members of the House Affairs Select Committee, chair of the Scottish Government's New Scots Refugee Integration Policy Committee. She is author of numerous books and articles. She's a published poet, columnist, broadcaster, and commentator, and a regular international keynote speaker. She's also a member of the Iona community. Distinguished guests, please join me in welcoming the very, very excellent Professor Alison Phillips as she talks to us about leveraging on common advantages of African migrants in conflict transformation. Please forgive my pronunciations, Professor. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, just if I might say thank you, first of all, to Dr. Olson for um, 
inviting me to um, address your distinguished society and to you Emmanuel for that lovely introduction. It's really great for me to now add Nigeria to that list of countries that I have worked in, even if right now I'm on my Zoom stick, which is a little bit like a broomstick. And, and maybe whenever I hear that biography, I do feel slightly, um, I feel slightly strange because I think, who is this woman? Um, because usually when I hear this biography, I've actually just spent yeah. some time scrubbing the kitchen floor after my grandchildren have left a, a, a trail of devastation, water and flour from whatever it is they've been doing. Um, and I'm sure you can all appreciate what that's like in, in these times where we're actually having to work in ways that we're not that accustomed to and where we're all broadcasting to you from our homes and our studies. But it's really lovely to be here and I'm also very much listening, looking forward to hearing from Lazarus later. The Ethnic Minority Law Centre in Glasgow is an extraordinary place. It's done enormous service to migrants from all over the world and I I'm, I'm particularly want to salute the work that you do, Lazarus, and it's, it's a real honour and a privilege for me to share our platform with you. I um, I'm going to suggest that I share my screen um, with you because I've prepared a few slides to take you into the world of my work. Um, and um, so I'm just going to bring those up right now um, and um, allow these to, um, to just be on screen for you. Um, so you can see me, but you can also see the slides. Let me start this from the beginning. And then that's under under my control. Um, and what I thought I would do was really bring you into the work of the UNESCO chair at the University of Glasgow. Tell you a little bit about why it's a real honor for the university to, to hold a chair and for me and my team to have been appointed and to really stress that everything I do is always collective work. Um, it's never just me. I'm the one who, as my husband would tell you, is comfortable speaking in public, but I am absolutely surrounded by an, a glorious team of people who work with me in the UNESCO chair at the University of Glasgow. And here they are. Um, so you can see my team there on the slide, um, all tangled up as we used to be allowed to be. Um, and um, some of the, the scholarship holders, the UNESCO scholarship holders who are working with me at the moment, Hiab Johannes, um, Hannah Rose Thomas, Gamali Todro, Nadensua Todro, Lauren Roberts, Bella Holchhaven, Giovanna Passetta, and Tawana Sitole, who are all part of my core team. And maybe to just say that there are around 400 UNESCO chairs worldwide. Universities can apply for the honor of holding or having UNESCO designation. So it's a lot like you've probably heard of um, the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Um, in fact, as engineers, you've almost certainly been involved in some of the, the work that is done to preserve those sites worldwide. You have your own in Nigeria, um, we have our own in Scotland, and within Glasgow, we have the City of Music, the designation of Glasgow as a creative city. And also in the City of Glasgow, we have the first ever UNESCO Chair in Refugee Integration, through languages and the arts. And it's myself and my team who hold it. We often joke, and I think you'll appreciate this humor, that the chair is not so much a chair as a sofa or a set of cushions or some stools on the floor because so many people are part of the work of integration. No one person can easily integrate into something um, or be integrated into something or allow someone to integrate and enable that to happen. Um, and so we very much stress that collective work that we do. We also want to change the story. So I am sure as uh, members of the um, Nigerian Engineering Society, um, a, a, a Glasgow branch, um, and as distinguished members from around the world, that you are well used to engineers migrating around the world. And I loved what you did when you were suggesting a title for me. I think it's the first time I've been given a title of leveraging the uncommon advantages of African migrants, particularly in conflict transformation. I love that leveraging is a word that my own surrogate father would have been very proud of as the 
James Watt Professor of Electronic Engineering at the University of Glasgow, the, the late great Professor Chris Wilkinson. Um, I, I, leveraging was very much one of his words and it feels really appropriate for me to be using that in the title because I see time and again that the real work of integration of refugees is done in the first instance by other migrants, maybe from the continent of Africa, maybe from the Middle East, maybe from Southeast Asia, sometimes from Latin America and South America, but by the people who provide the first hospitality of a familiar culture and a familiar language in a place of arrival. And for me, that starts in Glasgow. It starts in the city where I have lived for 25 years. I'm still, to a certain extent, a new Scot, but I've lived here for longer than anywhere else um, in the world, though I've lived in many different places, as you could tell. But for me, it's really important to acknowledge that the majority of the work of hospitality, of enabling people to make a new life somewhere, is done by other diasporic communities, other migrant communities in a city. It's rare that it is done first and foremost by the host population, by the indigenous population of that country. That comes, but it comes in time. And it's a big bridge to cross. It's not easy to go from arrival to being in a place where you feel at home in a new culture. And crossing that bridge needs many people to accompany you for it not to be quite a frightening, even vertiginous journey. So a lot of what we're about is changing the story, changing the story about integration and about migration in particular, and about displacement. The story that we read in the mainstream media is one of xenophobia, it is one of hostility, it's one of the hostile environment, it's one which suggests that our country is, to use the inflammatory language of some of our politicians, being broken into by migrants on boats. And yet when we look at the facts as academics, we know that fewer people have come into our country and claimed asylum this year than ever before in the last 20 years. We know that claims for asylum are going down because it's much harder to enter the United Kingdom safely. Many people are already dying en route. Some are being intercepted in the Mediterranean and sent back to Libya before they can make a claim in a country that is a signatory of the convention, of the refugee convention. And so we, we've really aimed within our work at UNESCO and at the University of Glasgow to tell the honest story of the fact that the majority of migrants and majority of refugees in the world are not in the global north and certainly not in the United Kingdom, but are actually hosted by many of the countries across the global south. The majority hosting countries of migrants around the world are yes in the ECOWAS region, are yes in countries like Uganda and Ethiopia, like um, Kenya, like Turkey, like Jordan. These are the countries where there are millions of people who are being hosted. And the one country in Europe that stands out is the only country in Europe that fulfilled its obligations under the Council of Europe's treaty, which says in Article 1, that in the event of a war on the borders of Europe, each member state will take the correct proportion according to its GDP in order to make sure that those are given asylum who will need it. And Germany took, uh, st took up that challenge and resettled around a million Syrian refugees and has continued to take in really quite a large number. I think last year it was around 250,000. Um, in our own country, we promised three years ago, uh, no, we promised four years ago in 2016, that we would take 20,000 um, from the Syrian conflict. And um, so far, we've taken around six or 7,000. So we've still a long way to go in this particular COVID year. And the um, resettlement in, in our country has been paused at this moment in time. So we're just trying to change the story and say, if we really want to understand how refugee in integration occurs, we need to think about it differently. We need to think about it from different perspectives. And for me, we need to focus on languages and the arts and not only tell a tale of conflict and a tale of trauma. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we have here, um, 
is some of the ways in which we've been trying to think about integration at a conceptual level. So we've been thinking about migration, but acknowledging that migration means people will arrive with a cultural heritage, a tangible and intangible cultural heritage, is how UNESCO speak of this, from the places that they have left and often from the places that they have transited through. And that to honour the dignity of the human being and to honour the dignity of the migrant, that heritage needs to be honoured and respected and, in, as, and part of the integration journey. That means um, respecting the languages that people speak. That means respecting the fact that learning a language takes a long time if it's not your mother tongue and that you might miss hearing your mother tongue and that hearing other languages on the street is a sign of a vibrant community, much as we experience it when we visit um, much of sub-Saharan Africa and Africa itself, where um, multilingualism is the mother tongue. It's normal. It's not, uh, rather as I am doing to you at the moment, um, something that only happens monolingually in one language. And we've been trying to get beyond these models of deficit that we hear all the time around migrants and migration policy, where people will say, the problem with those migrants is their lack of English. The problem with those migrants is their lack of skills. The problem with the migrants is their lack of understanding. We've been trying very hard to move away from those models and rather turn them back on ourselves as a host population and say, if you're teaching English in a classroom, full of people who have arrived from refugee backgrounds and refugee sending countries. How many languages on average might each individual have in that classroom? And how many do you have as a speaker of English? And maybe you need to think about the richness of the languages in your, your room, the incredible plentifulness that there is of languages and what those languages do in society, creating integration, enabling diasporic connection between migrants, enabling people to translate, to accompany, to befriend, to help one another in ways that go through those few years before people come into a fuller understanding of English, for example. So we want to get away from those deficit models and understand that in a process of integration, everyone is always learning from each other. We also have deliberately said within the UNESCO work that we'll learn from unexpected places. So when we put in our proposal for the UNESCO chair, we didn't say we were going to learn from European countries. We didn't say we were going to learn from North America. We, it, we didn't say we were going to learn from Australia. We didn't go to the other Anglophone countries. Instead, we said we wanted to learn from the Gaza Strip, um, the, the country where the category of refugees where, where the state of Israel was founded after the Second World War to host refugees, but where in the Gaza Strip there are then the displaced peoples internally who are the Palestinian citizens and equally in the West Bank. And if we're, un if we're going to understand the conflict that there is and how that is transformed on a daily basis, we need to learn from the experts who are the Palestinian refugees and those who have come from the um, Jewish diaspora to take up the offer of a home in Israel themselves and to learn from that conflict situation that is far from resolved but where we see transformational activity. We wanted to learn from Ghana where there is a really quite remarkable policy of integration and of hospitality where there are refugee camps that have um, turned into new cities and are now um, vibrant economic hubs and places of innovation. Not everything is rosy, but there's a, a possibility of return and transit as countries like Liberia or Sierra Leone have stabilised and that has led to new flows of economy. We wanted to learn about that particular situation rather than the ghettoizing and the detentionizing and the destitution that um, the, U the UK has as its policies in many cases for refugees and asylum seekers. And we wanted to learn from Zimbabwe, which is largely now a transit country, but used to be a key sending country as well, looking at how people have arrived, but also the many people from the Commonwealth who came on fresh talent schemes, thankfully now being opened up again after a recent legislation change within the UK. 
And then we wanted to look at Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, I always call it Aotearoa New Zealand because that offers it its two names. Aotearoa is the name of the Māori people, the indigenous people of Aotearoa, the original land before the settlers came, many from Scotland, and called it New Zealand. And we wanted to look at how that country, because of its legal treaties, has come to a place of reparation of great colonial damage that has been done, has come to a place of treaty, of apology and change, and what it means to live with a diversity of internally displaced peoples, and then looking at its refugee integration and migrant integration policy. And again and again and again, what we've seen happening here is the way that the arts have been used and languages have been vital in conflict transformation. In Scotland, when we looked at the, the data as we did our survey for the New Scots Integration Strategy for the Scottish Government, um, a programme which I chair on behalf of the Scottish Refugee Council, COSLA and the Scottish Government, we found when we asked people and we had an extraordinary response from people of refugee and asylum background, um, 800 uh, of them in total responded to our consultation and they said that the most important thing for them to feel at home and feel dignified was that their languages were dignified and their cultural heritage was respected. After that, 85% um, saying that, and after that, around about 45% then said the next most important thing was having the right to work and have a job. And we found this really interesting as we were beginning to do our own research. And it shows us how numbers can be distorting, numbers can be problematic. We hear statistics and we often take them out of context. And as you know as engineers and as I know, as the foster mother of an African refugee background engineer herself, my daughter studied um, civil engineering, it's really important to get the numbers right, but it's really important to understand how they might be distorted. We've worked quite a bit with this lovely symbol within our team. And um, the symbol is um, an Akan symbol. It comes from um, West Africa. Many of you will recognize it. Um, and it contains a great deal of knowledge and understanding. Um, the symbol is called Funtu Funumfu Denchen Funumfu. It's about the Siamese crocodiles, the crocodiles where the stomach is joined, who have to share that stomach so that everybody, everybody has enough. I want to tell you a little bit about our two scholarship holders, Hiab Johannes. Hiab is a remarkable young man. You can find information about him on our website. He's an Eritrean refugee. He formerly worked as a lawyer with UNHCR in um, Egypt. Um, he's a survivor of torture and he has now acted on behalf of many other survivors of torture himself as a lawyer. And he's now working with me as a PhD student, really deeply to understand the particular plight of Eritrean refugees and the particular difficulties that they face themselves. And then Hannah Rose Thomas, who I, and I think her work will be really interesting to you um, as Nigerian engineers in particular. Um, she's a, a, a profoundly beautiful artist who has worked with women who have survived atrocities and are refugees themselves. So she worked with UNHCR to decorate those, those really rather drab tents and make them bright and colourful. She's worked with the Rohingya refugees. She's worked with the women who have survived um, rape at the hands of ISIS. She's worked with the Yazidi women. She's worked with women in Jordan. And then this is her recent work, um, Hannah's recent work in her art project for survivors of Boko Haram and Fulani violence. And in this work, um, she enabled women to learn to paint their stories themselves. Many of these women um, were, when they were released from Boko Haram, had been raped and were pregnant, and then were um, disowned by their villagers because of the shame that attaches still to rape for women. Um, and so she was part of some of their, their rehabilitation project work. Um, and she enabled them to draw their own pictures, to see themselves in a different way. And this is some of the artwork that they produced using beautiful fabric from the local market. Very like the fabric that I'm wearing here, and maybe I'll tell you the story of that later. Here are the words of Charity, one of the women who she worked with, who just said, I'm so happy. I have never held a pencil in my life before. And this is the first time I've been able to write my name and even draw my face. And here they are with Tears of Gold, which is the title of Hannah's project, giving dignity to them. 
and this is an image of them all together standing in solidarity and in bright colours showing their self-portraits. I work with two artists in residence who are paid on my team um, and they are both quite remarkable men, um, both of them artists, um, Tawana Sitole, who you can see there playing um, a musical instrument that um, carried the death penalty for playing it for three generations in Zimbabwe from the British. Um, but this particular instrument that he has has survived and he now uses it as an instrument of conflict transformation to tell the story of survival, to tell the story that a cultural heritage can survive, that languages can survive, that people can continue through and their work can be dignified um, by organisations like UNESCO. And then on the other side, wearing really quite the most beautiful Scottish kilt I think I've ever seen, actually made by himself in kente cloth for his graduation, is Dr Gamali Todro, who is a multi-genre artist. He makes his own kora, he uses pipes, he's an engineer of music himself, he makes his own pipes and plays them beautifully himself. And you can see him there at his graduation, um, December two years ago. Um, in this kilt that he had made to surprise me as his supervisor. I didn't know he was doing it until he rocked up on stage ready for his graduation and there he was in this extraordinary kilt. What Gamali has done is brought all the musical instruments together from across sub-Saharan Africa. So um, uh, the, the wind instruments, the guitar instrument and the drums and in bringing them together he's created the first ever symphonic orchestra the Heart Orchestra. They played for the arrival of the Queen's Baton at the 2014 Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. Here they are playing in the cloisters at the University of Glasgow. He's composed music for them to play and he brings them together as a team um, of integration. Some of them are folk museums, uh, musicians from Ireland and Scotland. Others are from Sierra Leone, from Burkina Faso, from Morocco, from Germany, from Denmark, from Ghana from um, across the, the, the stretch of, of the continent of Africa. And he um, brings their music together. And from time to time, we're lucky enough to get enough funding to bring them together and they can just delight and entertain us. Now, Denso Todro, another of my artists in residence, you might have been to Calvin Grove and seen the New World Culture Exhibition. Um, in it, there's a little video screen that Gamali as a filmmaker has put together. But this, this is the beautiful, modern day wedding dress made out of kente cloth commissioned by Calvin Grove not just for a one-off exhibition that might last for a couple of months but for the permanent exhibition in the World Cultures Gallery. It's the centerpiece. It has the headpiece that comes from Ghana that was in the um, stores of Calvin Grove Museum and Nardenso was able to go in and find this with Pat Allen and bring it out and rehabilitate it and put it centre stage and then show this beautiful modern piece of um, fa uh, fashion design and engineering that she's put in a case. One of my favourite things to do on a Saturday afternoon is go and watch children run into that gallery. Um, yeah, and I just see these wee bands coming in and going, Mummy, Mummy, look how beautiful this dress is! And the sheer delight and knowing that that is integration, that is it happening. The other thing I can let you into as a secret is that that wedding dress would fit me because it was designed to fit me. And actually when it was commissioned I was wearing the jacket that Nardenso made for me for my inaugural UNESCO lecture, the one I'm wearing for you tonight. And it was when the, the, the curator at Calvin Grove saw the jacket and the skirt on me, she said, we need that in the museum. And Nardenso said, I'm sorry, but this was a gift, but I will make one for you that is even more beautiful. And there it is. And then another piece that's in that same culture gallery that Tawana and my artist in residence has made about his poetic name, his totem tradition, about the culture and understanding that is deep and long and ancient and has survived colonization and come through and fused and moved with the different strands of cultural change over time. And here he is reciting the poem in front of it, this beautiful light box with the illustrations which were designed by his wife, Tanim. Integration. 
The word refugee may be one you've heard of, this lovely word to describe refugees who have made Glasgow their home. This wonderful project where you can just send in a letter with advice from the locals in Glasgow to say that you're welcome. And I love what the kids send in. Welcome to Glas Glasgow. Okay, we hope you're safe. We want to help you for everything. You must be happy in Glasgow. So, cheap supermarkets, Lidl and Aldi, we wish you a nice future here. There's the message, there it is. There's a picture of um, the horse and the Duke of Wellington that you see in the centre of Glasgow with the traffic cone on their heads. So lovely humour that's being brought forward, all helping people find a way into the city. Here's another one from the Refugee project that we work with. Welcome to Glasgow, it's a very big city. People in Glasgow are very good. We like to go to the park. You can go to the city centre in Glasgow, Argyll seat, shopping for clothes. You can go to the museum, which are free. I hope you can enjoy Glasgow and be happy to live here. From Bahaldeen and Karama. Something lovely there, again, you hear it in the names. Other migrants doing integration for those who've just arrived. Refugee, a person who, upon arrival in Glasgow, is embraced by people, uh, 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 by the city, a person also considered to be a local, because we're all for somewhere, we're all from somewhere. And here I see two of the people I work with, both former refugees, leading our work um, within Refugee Festival, now working for different organisations and making sure that others are welcomed in, these people who are bridges themselves. Um, every year we host a small conference and we limit it to 100 to keep it intimate but where you don't know anything other than people's first names so we dispense with all those titles I'm just Alison and I wear a badge that says I'm just Alison and we welcome everybody in and everyone tells their story and shares and I'm going to share a little of this video so you can get a bit of a taste of how we do this together at the end it was really nice. to work with art and with languages rather than only focusing on legal roots or trauma or negative stereotyping was because it's too heavy you can't stay in that place of struggle all the time one of the hardest things about working in the refugee sector is the burnout is the sheer exhaustion of the work of struggling to get a tiny little win day in day out and I'm sure that that's something really familiar to Lazarus that he might speak about as well um, it's really difficult work and we wanted to show that as well as in, in our team with our mission statement of holding that bowl of tears, we would also be expanding the space for joy. Um, we've been working with the Royal Society of Edinburgh to enable refugee background scholars and artists and entrepreneurs 
to be made fellows of the Royal Society of Edinburgh's Young Academy. And these are two of the portraits that Ian Campbell has painted for the Royal Society. They're now in their permanent collection. Deborah Kayembe and Pina Aksu are the two women featured here. Deborah is the first ever black woman to have a portrait hung in the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And that changes the story. The most painted woman in the world is the Queen. As a refugee background woman herself, she never expected to have her portrait painted, let alone to be hung in a royal society. And yet here she is on display and able to talk about what a difference that makes, what a story that is to be able to tell, changing the story again and again. And that's what for us conflict transformation is. Conflict transformation is changing the story. That's the mission of um, UNESCO. One of the things we've done with our UNESCO chair logo is have it translated into indigenous languages. Here it is in Shona, we have it in Ga and Akan, we have it in Gaelic, we have it in Ewe, um, we have it in Dangbe. It's really important to us to honour the languages amongst us, not just English. And in the preamble to the UNESCO institution, um, we have a phrase that says, since wars begin in the minds of people, it's in the minds of people that the defences of peace must be constructed. And you can't construct defences of peace if people can't understand you, or if they're only hearing it in the language of domination and of war, of extraction, of theft, of colonialism. In a project we're working in at the moment around these different countries, we're looking at how the sustainable development goal number five on women and girls and sustainable development goal 16 on peaceful institutions that can sustain cultures of peace, how civic institutions like your own of the Nigerian Engineering um, Society Glasgow branch are doing the work of peace by being tenacious, by being democratic, by enabling the memberships of people inclusively and particularly in arts um, areas by um, opening out into diversity. We're at just at the moment entering strand two of the work where we'll begin commissioning some small scale projects across those countries. And here we are working with a group of asylum seekers and young people from Scotland, again, to make music together, to show people they don't have to even understand one another's language to be able to make something really beautiful. And that is how we begin to make peace or transform conflict, not by focusing on the conflict, but by focusing on those things that we have in common that we can do to work together. We're now taking this work into the, 12, the 20 million pound hub um, that Emmanuel was mentioning in my, my biography. These are the corridors we're working with, looking at the way in which migration goes backwards and forwards, be it for um, work with employment, be it children who are displaced, be it textile workers and domestic workers, be it refugees, be it natural disasters, be it common links between countries. All of these helping us understand the majority of movements around the world which are not north as uh, south to north that's a very small amount but are here in the stretched out world of the global south our work within that has been working with proverbs and cloths and traditions things people carry with them here we have this beautiful piece of cloth and the proverb from um Nardentua from in in ga say anuma entua obwa da and this time it's mine to ask for your forgiveness for my pronunciation. But the bird that does not fly does not eat. This understanding of migration as necessary to life and always has been. And that it's always been a reciprocal project. Here I am with our Ghanaian dancers at the Solas Festival, having fought the UK government and managed to get 20 visit visas, um, refusals overturned so that these people could dance at our inaugural lecture for the UNESCO chair at the Solas Festival in 2018. And here I am in um, New Zealand, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, with Beruz Bachani, um, able to host him in one of the first talks he did as a free man after coming to Aotearoa, New Zealand, and speaking to us of his experiences at Manus Island um, uh, as, as detained by Australia in breach of the Refugee Convention. He wrote the most incredible book. It is a work of art. It is perhaps the most important um, memoir and reportage of the 21st century. And he wrote his way to freedom in, the, in this book. And this was an electrifying time for us to speak together. 
But finally, just as I come to the end of my presentation to you and maybe take some questions, for me, this work is personal. This work is personal. It is about the whole world. It is about putting structures in place that will allow us to hold the bowl of tears and expand the space for joy. But back in 2009, there was a knock on my door. And for many years, I'd been hosting destitute refugees in my home because through my work in detention centers in Glasgow, out at Dungaval, I knew that if people were released on bail, they had nowhere to live that often they had no money at all. And this will be very familiar to you from your own experiences, no doubt, of the hostile environment. And so my husband and I started taking people in. They were often women who'd been trafficked. Sometimes, in many cases, they were pregnant. And we were just a safe place for them to live and stay for a while. We knew very little about their stories or their lives. We never really asked the question, why are you here or where are you from? That's not our question to ask. We just provided a safe place, a bed, some warmth and food for as long as it was needed. In 2009, um, a 16 year old girl turned up on our doorstep and she came over our threshold. During the time she was with us, she was age disputed, she was threatened with deportation, she was put into detention, she was moved in ju around jurisdictions. Um, we went through all the legal process that it was necessary to make her safe. And eventually, about three and a half years later, she was recognised as a refugee. She's our foster daughter, our daughter. My husband and I could never have children of our own, but she has brought us the most incredible joy um, through really deep suffering. And this young lady here you are seeing is my wonderful granddaughter, a granddaughter who doesn't call me grandmother. She calls me Abai because that is her mother language. And that's the language she's given to me to speak to her in. Thank you so much for listening. I'm delighted to take questions. Wow, wow, wow. Um, Dr. Imane, do you want to proceed? Please? Yes. Wow, th thank you for that. Thank, thank you so much. That's, that's, that's stunning. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This is um, very emotional, touching, and uh, we could see the, the, how personal the whole story is to you and all your efforts across the world to help people stay in, migrants get uh, integrated into to Glasgow to the world easily, to find a home for themselves away from home. And it's also something we can relate to because um, the Nigerian Society of Engineers, Glasgow, London, UK, all of the branches here is basically composed of people from Nigeria, from different places coming into the UK to stay. And things like this open up discussions for us to find out how we can uh, use the opportunity of what we have here and our stay here to help ourselves, to help our people back home and to keep on the, the language, the arts and all of the resources that we, we, the diversity that we come with and that we also meet here. So I really hope that we'll get some questions to keep the interactions going. Uh, feel free to use the chat box if you have any questions, uh, any comments, interactions. This is the time for it. I'll be handing over to my colleague, Engineer Sharp, who will be moderating the question and answer session. Engineer Sharp. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, uh, Alison, Professor Alison Phillips, Phipps, that's, that was a great presentation and emotional one like we've had. So um, the way we're gonna go now for the questions will be uh, if you could put your hands up uh, from the Zoom, handle. If you raise your hand up, I can spotlight you and take your question verbally. Alternatively, I'm looking through the chat, chat room and I'm not sure I've seen the questions coming through for Alison. So please, uh, you may just put your question across. And uh, I guess a few people may be typing just now. So once I spot your and I'm also hand, I'm I'm just okay. looking in the comments. I've just seen. I've just also seen a really important um, comment from Livinus um, about the TV anchor who just broke down in tears, saying that the election of Joe Biden is a vindication that being a decent person matters. Um, and I just, I, it's really lovely for me to read that too, just to know how much this means um, to a lot of people. Um, 
So yeah, just looking at the lovely comments and some of the lovely private messages that I've just had, it's really, it's really beautiful to see. But but I think maybe also to say, <laughs> there's a bit of um, I suppose um, I've realised there's um, one of the things that I've learned is that integration is so much two way. Um, and recently on an Eritrean um, site, somebody said, um, Alison isn't um, um, 100% British, she's 60% Eritrean. And then somebody started saying, actually, no, she's Ghanaian. And somebody else, no, she's Zimbabwean. And I certainly feel as though I've lost my heart to Africa um, through this journey, but I have been taught and have learned so much. Um, and I love the fact that these days, if I sit down in a gathering like this, um, I probably know as much as you do about Western Union. And yet when I sit down in a gathering of people who are more like myself, they might not even know what Western Union is. And I feel like I've, I've also learned so much about other cultures, other ways of doing things, other business um, opportunities and ways of working. And I've learned to understand them and learn to respect them and learn to see the value in much of what happens. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, it seems probably people are still waiting to put a question through. Right. Um, I'll just give one. Uh, do you also, uh, Professor Alison, does your center work with uh, the, uh, you've pretty much explained the angle with migration on, in terms of refugee integration. Uh, what about the kind of migration from the scale force, uh, yeah. labor force and all that. Is that some kind of study, uh, comparative yeah, study so in terms of the impact from that set of That's a really, that's a really good question and a really important question. And that has been quite a big part of our work. Yes, with refugees as a main focus, we've, we've done a lot of work trying to enable refugees to enter higher education um, and to, to reduce the barriers, which are often the, the barriers of structural racism that then have led institutions in higher education to look again at admissions policies, to look again at their, their understandings. Um, uh, so, so a lot of the work we do, by doing work with refugees, we have found that we are simultaneously doing work for migrants from other parts of the world, but also for, um, for ourselves within, um, within our own community, because anything we can do to increase the diversity You're muted. I've just been muted somehow. I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> um, and um, the other thing that I've really, we, that we're doing at the moment with this project, the MIDEC project across the Global South, is really looking at skilled um, migrants and unskilled migrants um, and who it is who's moving in different places and how a change in government policy may, might make a really big difference. So for example, in the MIDEC work, um, of my colleagues in Jordan and Egypt. They're really interested in the way in which the decisions to enable Syrian refugees to access jobs in Jordan has then meant that some of the skilled migrants from um, Egypt, particularly the men, have had to return home because they've um, that because the market for jobs has changed. So that um, one small policy change has what we are calling, and my colleague Heaven Crawley is calling, ripple effects. So a small policy might have a completely unintended consequence um, further down the line that we're not aware of. Some of those might have good effects, some of those might have bad effects. And what we're doing within the MIDEC Migration Project, which is, um, it, it's entitled Migration for International, for Inequality and Development. We're looking at equity we're looking at equity. We're looking at how it is that migration can enable equality. Um, we know that migration can sometimes come and produce great inequalities. If you have policies where migrants um, don't have easy paths to settlement, where financial transactions are difficult, where there are a lot of barriers for migrants to integrate into society. Whereas if we take away those barriers and if there is good solidarity, if there is good um, labor laws, if there are good unions, we see inequalities reducing within migrant populations and within local populations too. So these ripple effects are really interesting to us. And there are some absolutely fascinating pieces on the MIDEC post, um, which are um, 
available to people if they're interested and um, they talk about for example the situation with textile workers um, in Malaysia at the moment who have gone to work in Bangladesh um, they're looking at for example things we would never have thought of but the manufacturing of masks during the pandemic for PPE and the incredible labor exploitation that is going on in some parts of the world around that so what do we do to bring just processes to migrants to enable migrants to have decent work, which is obviously one of the sustainable development goals. And it's one of the core goals that, that is leading our work in MIDEC around these migration issues. We're at the early stages of just, we're about to do um, a major household survey. So some really important statistical data will come out of that, including some statistical data on culture and language, but really looking at um, how migrants are able to access welfare, access understanding, what their connections are back home, and how we might look at high-skilled migrants around that and the important contribution that many have brought. And I think, you know, uh, this is, might be an area that uh, Lazarus also speaks about later, but it's been really important to... Um, acknowledge um, the very important pathways for highly skilled migrants that were part of Fresh Talent in Scotland, a wonderful scheme that has brought an enormous wealth to our country, but also the amount of work we've had to do to continue to get people to, to, to reopen the post-study work visa and those, those routes that would allow people to come and study and then practice their skills within um, employment um, in, in, in the United Kingdom. And we're really pleased that we've had a little bit of success across the collective movement that has been um, lawyers and activists and academics working to provide the evidence of how good this is for our society. Thank you very much. Yeah, just two questions uh, uh, and we'll, that will round it up. Yep. Uh, we'll take one from Olayinka Ogunleye and then I'll read one from the chat room. Uh, how have COVID-19 affected migration to, into the UK in particular? So that's one of the questions. Let's get the second question so that you can handle both of them at the same time. Mr. Gunle. Thank, thank you very much uh, for putting this together. And many thanks, Alison, for uh, your great works. Quite impressive and comforting to know uh, that we still have you know, this kind of disposition um, towards humanity. My, my quick question is how much has your work influenced governmental policies? Um, any interface, because it's cutting across to me as if um, individuals come into the skull of your hands through your works and passion after, you know, they have been battered by some hostile policies or what have you. So how much has your world been able to influence policy? Any interface at this level? Thank you. That's so, that is such an important question. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm audited on this almost every day of my life. Um, we, as a public servant, it's a really important question about the use of public money to pay my salary to make a difference. Um, as you will know, as, as, um, as scientists, the causal link in science is one that few scientists will ever claim. They will rarely say there's a direct link between this and this, um, and that it's actually something that scientists are, are hesitant to, um, to claim. And in the arts, humanities and social sciences, even more so. So I'm not gonna give you a direct question to how much impact there has been, because it's very difficult to count, and I think it's a collective effort. And I also think if you have a, a government that is hostile to migration, as our own is, the best you can hope for is that you help things get worse less quickly. And that's really quite devastating as a thing to experience yourself. Um, but what we do see is small victory after small victory after small victory. So if you think of Windrush, if you think of the visit visas, if you think of the post-study work visas, if you think of the ability of artists to come and perform at the Edinburgh Festival, if you think of the fact that within the UK, people claiming asylum can access interpreters, people with legal difficulties will have 
an interpreter in the court. If you think of the way that we have a language policy now in Scotland that isn't just English, but it includes Gaelic, it includes sign language, it includes Scots, and it now includes an understanding not just that migrants will learn English, but that those in the host community might enter into a, a language friendship with someone who will teach them another language. Um, if you think about the work in UNESCO at the moment, where they have decided to take on our work from the UNESCO chair into the central UNESCO committees to be part of protecting tangible and intangible cultural heritage in situations of protracted conflict and displacement, looking at how the arts can genuinely foster new life for people across the world by, by according dignity um, to people's culture, people's language, people's ways of life, rather than expecting people to lose that. Those would be the things that I would point to as tangible differences that are being made in policy terms around the world at the moment. Um, the world's biggest industry is tourism, and this shades into the other question. Um, at any one time before COVID, there was a city the size of Chicago in the air above America of business travellers and of tourists moving between places. Migration is huge, we are nomadic peoples, we are people who move, and COVID has stopped that. COVID means that we are not moving. COVID means migration right now is prevented. COVID means that when my grandson was born in March, even with the hostile environment, there was no way I could get my daughter's parents from where they are as refugees in the Sudan into the country to be there with my daughter at that birth. We couldn't be together as a family and this will be very familiar to all of you. In this I accompany you in those often devastating moments where you can't have your family at your children's graduation in the UK or you can't travel home to be with somebody who is on their deathbed. These are deep and tragic things. And what I think we're starting to see is an easing of that, um, is in individual cases, something changing and moving on. So yeah, COVID has, has rapidly impacted on, on, um, on our cultures of grief, our cultures of accompanying people when they die. And that is even harder for migrant populations. And in Glasgow, we've never been out of the news with the deaths of the asylum seekers. And that isn't because there haven't been deaths down south, it's because the activist communities within Glasgow have refused to let death be the last story and have been determined to honour the dead, but also to acknowledge the enormous cost of what we've done to asylum seekers and migrants in the city through isolation and the ways we've isolated people in quite dangerous conditions. So I'd say, you know, we do our best. Give me a government that is not hostile, like the Scottish government to migrants, that wants and has pushed for post-study work visas, that wants an integrated society that has as its aim, as the Scottish government does, a society where all can flourish and where everyone's talents can be honoured and used, then we can begin to work. There's more that I believe the Scottish government can do, and I'm, I'm proud to work towards that. But it's much easier doing that within the devolved um, associations at the moment than it is within the UK government. Um, it's much easier even than doing it within the European Union. And it's certainly much easier than doing it until perhaps the beginning of my talk today in, um, in the United States of America. Because until the beginning of my talk today, um, I was under the refugee travel ban to the United States. The only way I can enter the United States as somebody who has worked with refugees in the Sudan, who has stamps from Syria in my passport um, under Trump's travel ban, is to do it by Zoom. And many of my colleagues have seen this as a scandal, as a scandal that a UNESCO professor cannot enter um, the United States. And UNESCO too would um, see this as very problematic, the withdrawal of the United States from a body like UNESCO. UNESCO is 75 years old on the 16th of November, 75 years. And it is a scandal 
that the State of Israel and the, and the United States of America as signatures to those conventions have, have left and are no longer interested in protecting cultural heritage or intangible cultural heritage. And so when I see posted up that someone has burst into tears, I can tell you at half past four this afternoon, that was me too, because I might at some point be able to see um, the UNESCO rejoined by the United States of America. And that will mean more money and more power and more convening power to UNESCO to protect the cultures and languages and the sustainable heritage, the dance, the music, the beauty, these beautiful jackets and costumes that I'm wearing. This one meaning that I come to speak to you in peace. If I wore it upside down, I'd be coming in war. But that means that these things can be told to your children and to my children and to our grandchildren to come. And so that I would say is part of our work and part of our work sometimes and impact is that 15 years after starting to do this work and with an inculcation in my family history, if I go back to my grandparents who both were involved in this kind of work and if I honor them properly, I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. I haven't been silenced. I have been recognized for my work, which means that you too have been recognized for your work because every award and recognition that I receive, I give back to those who invite me those who listen to me and those who want to engage in this work with me, those people who migrate, who carry the stories to us all of the beauty of humankind. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Allison. Just a final question on this segment before we move on to the next one, because we are really hard pressed with time. Dr. P. Thank you very much, Alison. That's a very wonderful uh, story. I mean, it's not even a story yet actual things that you share with us. But I believe behind every genuine migration, there's a, there's a darker business of modern slavery. Yes. I helped to direct a movie about mm -hmm. three years ago called In a Strange Land. And I, I recommend everybody should go on YouTube and have a look at it. And we address the issue of uh, preventing the, the masters of modern slavery from recruiting people in the first place and also educating. So there's four P's there, prevention, prosecution, protection when they do come over and then partnership. So the prevention is to get those guys on the ground to make sure we stop them whatever way. Um, and I believe the government is the only person that can do that. Prosecution, when we do get them, prosecute them, send them to jail, lock them up to make sure the genuine people that really want to migrate because they want to better their life are able to do so and they don't get caught in all these uh, mix up. But the few that then come over due to these guys not doing their work, when they come over, we protect them. And this is where UNESCO has been doing fantastic work. I, I know all your work, you've been doing great on, on, these, on these protections uh, ability. And then try to get them to fit back into the community because they've been through hell to try to get them to understand that, yes, this is now your new home, your new life, and this is where you now belong, is also not very easy at all. And we think all of us, not just UNESCO, all of us here listening to you need to take a part, needs to play our own part in doing that. So my question to you, if you're, if you're the president of Nigeria or the president of America or whichever country, what will you do to stop these guys, these people that actually doing business and making money and making people life really difficult? Yeah, yeah. I, this is such a good question and such an important mm -hmm. question. And within our MIDEC project, we're looking at this under the rubric of intermediaries. Who are the intermediaries? Sometimes they are traffickers. Sometimes they are people enabling safety. So it may be organizations like Médecins Sans Frontières who are doing the work mm -hmm. of trying to create safe passages or rescue people as they're trying to move north. Um, or it might be people who are absolutely making a mint out of human misery and human suffering. One of the mm. things we know in the arts and humanities, um, it's one of those things about tragedy and comedy, is that um, some people have a good war. And at the moment we see a war on migrants and in the closing of the borders, the making it harder, the only people who profit are the people who are making money, who know a way around it. So the best possible thing you could do if you were president of a country is make safe passages. Safe passage for migration. And safe passage means um, 
facilitating the movement of people in ways which are dignified and ways which are legal. It is the lack of documentation or it is the lack of legal routes that lead people into taking other routes of desperation. You don't, you don't fall into the hands of a human trafficker because you want to. You fall into the hands because your children are starving and you know no other way. It's never the fault of the people who are being trafficked. It is very much the fault of the governments who create the safe route, who create a safe haven for that kind of work. So I would say you close them down. You close it down. You do not allow the safe passages. Closing down the Calais camp, that doesn't close it down. Creating safe routes safe ways of processing people, mass determinations like my colleagues in the law profession do for protection in places of conflict like they've done in the Sudan, like they've done in Liberia, where they have gone and said, yes, you are all now refugees, you have a right to a safe passage, and then enabling those safe passages to countries around the world where people can build a new life. And often the best thing there is the countries close to people, because that means that they're not so far away from the cultures they want to be in. But also being close to family, being with family because of all those integrating bonds. So those are the, the approaches. We need a radical rethink of what we mean by protection and what we mean by safety. And um, we need the United Nations to be part of doing that as the Global Compact for Migration is seeking to do. Thank you very much, Professor Alice. I think uh, we, 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 for, for time's sake, um, apologies to those ones who still have questions to ask. Uh, but what we can say, please do uh, put your question down in the chat room and we will uh, find a way to get the answers back to you. So I'll pass over to Emmanuel so that we can proceed to the second presentation. Emmanuel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Engineer Sharp. And thanks again to uh, Professor Allison and all who have asked questions and interacted um, at this session. This has been a wonderful interaction. I think there was a bit of a delay in asking the questions because of the nature of the, the, the emotions and the, the touching nature of the talk in the very beginning, and now people are waking up to it. I have questions of my own, but I'll just save it for maybe another time. So without uh, much ado, I'll be welcoming our second speaker. And, uh, and that is Mr. Lazarus Chisela, who will be speaking about becoming a UK resident post COVID-19, but majorly talking about uh, what to do at the Ethnic Minorities Law Center and how we can uh, get to become part of this in some ways. Mr. Lazarus Chileshe Chisela is the current development officer for Ethnic Minorities Law Center. And he owns an honors degree in law and a master of laws from the University of Strathclyde here in Glasgow. He specialized in UK immigration law. He is also the former president of the Scotland Zambia Partnership. Distinguished guests, I present to you Mr. Lazarus Chisela for his talk. Thank you so much. Sorry, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Emmanuel. Yeah. Um, is it possible I can share the vid the uh, yes. uh, the presentation? Yes, if you try to do that now. I okay, good. Um, that should be. Where is it? Um, So, maybe I can uh, try to see the uh, slideshow. Oh, yeah, good. <clears throat> yes. Um, before I uh, just that, um, I allow me, um, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, recognize Professor Allison, um, the the, um, the the organizers of this conference. Um, I'm very much humbled to be part of this um, successful story. But before I start, please allow me to uh, just touch on a few things that Professor Allison looked at. Um, she touched on a lot of things and, uh, you know, in dealing with the conflicts and displacement of people uh, from Africa, especially in terms of refugees and from other countries. Um, 
for me, this is closer to heart because um, without presentation, there are two things that are very vital um, to us. And uh, I'm also speaking as somebody, um, an African, um, who shares a lot of uh, values with uh, um, the Engineers Association of um, Nigerians. Um, two things that are very, you know, I really just want to look at, to, to talk about briefly, is um, that um, Professor Allison, um, demonstrated that she does not judge. And this is one of the most important thing uh, that I understand and I appreciate that she doesn't judge those people who come in this country and, they, and our association and our institution are working very hard not to um, judge people and uh, to welcome them and assist them. It's, it's very important um, when you're dealing with uh, people from other countries to have that kind of um, attribute of not judging people, no matter how they look like, no matter how they came into this country. As long as they're looking for refuge, you give them a hand. Professor Hallison, that's very cardinal for me. Uh, to understand also that um, this is what uh, one of the part of the things that we have learned today that um, what the, your, your uh, institution has done is to take this to the academic because I understand and believe that there's no way uh, such kind of a problem will be solved by using common sense. So uh, the fact that um, this is uh, supported by academia, what you're doing, for me, this is the greatest gift you can give to somebody so that they have a mindset change. So I really thank you for those two points. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> maybe I should also introduce maybe more about myself. I'm originally from Zambia and uh, I've been in this country for, from 2004 to debt and I fell in love with this country. Um, but I'm almost on the way back, I've over, overstayed my welcome. However, coming back to EMLC, uh, EMLC is um, a charity that um, was formed to look at the unmet needs of the BME, BMEs, that's black and ethnic minorities. the uh, unmet needs in, in relation to immigration. And the first one that uh, the, the founders looked at was the, um, um, the immigration. Because people, when people started coming into, this, into Scotland, the uh, high influx of uh, people from BMEs, there was um, a lot of challenges in ensuring that they regularized their stay here in the UK. So in 1991, um, people came together um, from the BMEs and from Scotland, and indigenous Scottish people, they came together and said, how do we solve this challenge of the unmet uh, needs of the BMEs in relation to immigration? So they said, let's form a charity that would be supported by the government and other institutions in terms of finance. They started it in, in Glasgow and this has now extended throughout Scotland. So um, Ethnic Minority Law Center has now got branches throughout Scotland. So we've got satellite offices in the islands and uh, throughout Scotland. However, the challenge of COVID has reduced us to um, online and telephone. That's how we meet our clients. Now, um, let's see. I need to move the, uh, yeah. So um, 
Now, Ethnic Priority Law Center as a charity has been supported by the councils in Scotland here. And uh, one of the major sponsors is North Lanarkshire Council. And uh, there are other institutions like um, Lottery. They've also been supporting this institution. So in terms of our funding, we, we are funded by these organizations. However, uh, there have been also some challenges in terms of funding recently because of the uh, first we had the financial crisis and now uh, with the COVID as well that has contributed. So most of the funding has been reduced. However, uh, in, in, um, to understand fully that the uh, Ethnic Minority Law Center still operates despite the fact that the funding goal has gone down, we also have the cost recovery system. When we had funding, the people that lived in those areas which were funded would be assisted uh, and advised on legal issues um, without paying legal fees. But uh, because of what um, I've gone on now, because of the credit crunch and uh, the issue with the um, uh, COVID-19, most of the places now they are subjected to um, legal fees. However, we are only asking for very little because as a charity, we don't make profit. So as a result, we give these services to people at a very low cost for those that come from areas which are not fully funded. Now, um, <clears throat> Ethnic Minority Law Center does not only deal with immigration, we also deal with employment law. We deal with injury claims, we deal with um, human rights and discrimination. So we provide advice and assistance up to the court and appeal. We do go to appeals as well, we do appeals as well. And <clears throat> having said that, um, covering these areas it's, it's actually very, very important to understand that when we offer these services, um, we offer them to assist um, the people that are vulnerable, people that do not have enough money to look for uh, private solicitors or to go to private firms that would charge them you know, exorbitant prices. Our aim is to assist the people. There are times when we assist people when they don't even have to pay anything, especially when they're in that situation. Now, I just want to, again, um, just go onto the steps of how you can get a visa to come to the UK. I think this is one of the most important thing when we look at uh, the people that are outside the UK, if they want to visit the UK, if they want to come and stay in the UK, and uh, if they want to come and study in the UK. And uh, looking at this association, which is um, a media of information that will deliver this information to a lot of people um, out there in Nigeria and within this country. So um, the first part, when you are trying to come to the UK, they are, um, these, the first person that you have to meet. Please, if you have any questions as I go on, um, if it's critical, please just let me know. The first part that um, you need to, um, to go through when you want to come to the UK is the first person, if you're outside the UK, is called the Entry Clearance Officer. Now, um, the issue on the entry clearance officer affects non-EN nationals. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about the EN national. I might maybe briefly talk about it, uh, but I'll talk about non-EN nationals. Non-EN nationals includes um, people that come from countries that are not part of the European Economic Area community. So um, African countries, and then EU nationals. Other countries from um, like United States is a non EU nationals. However, there are also countries that are non visa countries and 
visa countries. Non-visa countries are a little bit similar to the EA nationals, but by law, they are different. If you're an EA national, uh, you, have, you can only enter the UK when you meet the requirements of the immigration control. So all these countries that are non-EA nationals are subjected to immigration control to ensure that in order for you to come into the UK, you have to meet those. So the first person you meet is the entry grants officer. And when you meet the, meet the uh, you come through the uh, entry grants officer, you meet the requirements. Uh, there are different requirements um, in relation to different visas. So after the, um, the entry grants officer, then there are times when you come into the UK and you want to stay further. If you came with a student visa, for example, you meet the requirements that are required and when you satisfy that, you go through the entry grants officer. And then when we're in the country, as a student, there are reasons that you may find or use to stay in the UK, or that may compel you to stay in the UK. And when you reach those challenges of how you can further live in the UK, you apply for further leave to remain. That's a visa that you make when you are within the country. And uh, the next step from there, the third step you reach is, um, is the, um, the third step where now you, um, you apply for indefinite leave to remain or you settle, you apply for settlement to stay in the UK. So over here, further leave to remain, you have to meet certain criteria. There's a, there are certain requirements that you have to meet as a person who wants to apply for further leave to remain in the UK. And then when you have to apply for settlement, again, you have to meet certain requirements that are put there. Now, all these are as a result of the immigration control that have been put there. And uh, you find that all these immigration controls, they are not different from most of the countries in the world. They are almost the same. They made all these immigration control to ensure that there is the right number of people coming into the country to the, um, the people that are coming into the country are coming for the right reasons. And then to avoid any um, people that are not, um, do not meet the requirements in terms of criminal history and all that and other reasons. So um, before I studied immigration, I didn't understand exactly why people should be subjected to immigration control, but these are everywhere in the world. You need to know how many people are coming to the country and what type of people are coming into the country. So from this point, um, we understand this is the process. So from settlement, and if you again, Re meet the requirements of becoming a British, then you apply for a British citizenship. If you're a baby, you register as British. However, you may have heard people that um, they refuse my application for naturalization. Naturalization is a discretion of the state. It's not an entitlement that I'm entitled to become British, no. It's a discretion. So when you're applying for naturalization, they require very high standards. That's why uh, good character plays a major role and other, ish, other areas plays a major role. This is a type of application where they expect anybody who wants to be British to be able to know how to speak English, to be able to know to, how to write, to be able to communicate because they don't want you to, um, to go through a hard time. When you can't communicate, you can't write, you won't be able to be British. However, they have done it so differently for people that graduate from um, a university that uh, taught in English. If that can be approved by NAREC, your qualification, then you don't need to meet the English language test. So we'll look at that as we go on, but you also need to know a basic history of the UK. That's where you have to write life in the UK test. So after that, then, um, you can apply for British passport and become British. I know for Nigeria, 
you have two nationalities, so you can apply for British citizenship when you um, finished all the uh, four uh, stages. Now, I just, I'll just go through um, these visas <coughs> that are um, uh, very, very important to, um, to people who wants to come to the UK. The first one is visit visa. Then we have the spouse or unmarried partner, other family members, dependents, immigration, employment documents, students, and all applications under the uh, point-based system, visitors, diplomats, their family members, and domestic and um, non-asylum case and resolution legacy cases, applications such as pair postgraduate. And those not, and then also application for indefinite leave to remain up to the um, naturalization. Now, all these are the applications that we do. We deal with all these uh, areas of the law of immigration. So now let me just explain briefly on visitors visa. A lot of people might be wondering what should they do if they want to visit the United Kingdom? If you want to visit the United Kingdom from the word visitor, it is very clear that the guides, the guidelines or the law is very clear on that, that you are asking to visit the UK. And when you meet the, um, the requirements, there will be no way they'll refuse your visa to come to grant you the visa to enter the UK by the entry clearance officer. Visit visa, when you're visiting from the word visit, it means that you are only visiting for a specific period of time and you have to go. And the longest period you can stay in the UK on a visitor's visa is six months. So you can get a visa for six months, visit the UK and go back. When you have a visit visa, it doesn't mean that you cannot be given a multiple entry when you hear somebody has a visa for one year as a visit visa, it is a multiple entry, which means you can enter the UK on different occasions using that visa. It is valid for one year. So what it means is that you can enter the UK, stay in the UK for six months if you want up to the six months, but you can't stay for more than six months even if it's a one year multiple entry visa. Then you go back to your country and stay in your country for another six months before you can come in. However, some people have come in with a one year multiple entry visa and they have stayed um, for more than six months and then they have gone back and sometimes they have come back and then the next time they want to apply for another one year multiple entry visa, they are refused because they overstayed at one point when they stayed for more than six months. Now, what are the requirements for a visit visa in the UK? The requirements are that you must state clearly that you're coming to visit for six months or less than six months. Now, when you state that, you must provide the evidence that you're coming here to stay for that period. So the evidence that will show that you're only staying here for a short period of time will be the strong attachments that you have back home. And those attachments that you have there will demonstrate that you're not going to stay here forever. I'll give an example. If you are not studying, you are not working, you have nothing at home and you want to come to the UK as a visitor, it's highly unlikely that you'll be granted the visit visa because there's nothing that would demonstrate that you go back home, you go back to the country where you're coming from. So this is very critical and it's very, very important. Some people would advise you, know, you that you need to have a lot of money in the bank account, no. You don't need so much money in the bank account. You need to demonstrate that you'll be able to go back to your country by showing that you've got things that you're going to go back for to your country. 
if you're married, you've got kids, that would demonstrate that you've got a job. They know that you're going to go back to your job, you know, and uh, let's say you're looking after somebody who has um, special needs or more needs. They will understand that you're going back for your grandmother, for your mother, for, sir, for your brother, for a sibling, for an uncle that is, uh, you know, um, on long-term illness or somebody that, you know, is, is, is your wife or your children. But also, you also must demonstrate that when you come into the UK, you are not going to um, become a burden on the, um, on, the, on the government in relation to accessing public funds because they will not grant you public funds. And I, again, when you're coming here, you can't say I'm coming here to, to get married. You cannot get married on a visit visa. When you come or you are coming here is to visit and go, you can visit you, the person can visit anyone who is um, your friend, relative or somebody you, um, you've met, you can come and visit them. But you need to demonstrate again, if you're visiting somebody that you have met this person in person, or if you haven't met this person in person, you've been talking on the phone, there must be evidence to show that there is that kind of subsisting and genuine relationship between this person and you, if you have to come here. Now, these are the requirements that you require. So you need to provide evidence of that. Normally for a visit visa, it's a very simple visa, but the standards are very high because you have to demonstrate that you're gonna go back. So you can provide the evidence that you're working, you've got a job, um, you've got a family. Now to say that you've got a job, you need to provide six, at least six months bank statements, six months pay slips, and then you need to provide the evidence that uh, you're working a contract of employment or later from the employer. If you own a company, you also demonstrate that you are self-employed, you run your own company from, from your uh, jurisdiction. There are documents that to prove that you, are, you own a company and you own that property. There will be some transaction. Again, you need to provide, at least if you are self-employed, they would like to ensure that you have bank statements for one year. And if there are any receipts or invoices that you can provide as evidence, then you can come and visit. And if you're visiting somebody, they need to know that this person lives here in the UK, does not live in Italy or any other country. And when they live here, they need to demonstrate as well, provide evidence that they live in the UK. They need to provide six months bank statements here, pay slips if they're working, or if they're self-employed, they should provide evidence, HMRC documentation to show that they own the company and then one year bank statements to show that they've been running their own business. They should also demonstrate that there's accommodation that uh, you're coming here, you're not gonna live in a house that is overcrowded, but a house that has enough room for you to stay with them. That again, they can get the evidence from the landlord. If they, if they don't have the, uh, or if they are renting the house, they can get from the landlord. If they, are, they own the house, they can bring the mortgage statement letters to show documents to show that they own the house. Or if they buy, bought the house, they bought off the house, they should bring the title to deeds to show that they are coming to stay and go back. That is uh, on a visit visa. It's one of the simplest vis uh, application and the cost is very low. Normally this visit visa, depending on the country where you're coming from, you may even get a visit visa, which will cost 250 pounds or 200 plus pounds. From my experience, this is one of the cheapest visas you can apply for. Yeah, before I got to further, I just wanted again to, um, uh, to bring to attention um, about the asylum seekers and refugees, just explain briefly, uh, because um, uh, sometimes we misunderstand when we talk of refugees, we only think of refugees as people that are running from war, but a refugee can be anybody, can be anybody that is in danger of his or her life. And there is reasonable explanation to demonstrate that the government is unable to protect you. 
So there are people that are in this country who are refugees who come to seek asylum, who are recognized as refugees because they are running away from somewhere where their life is in danger. Of course, UK would accept to, uh, to, to look after you if your life is in danger and there's no one to protect you in that country. So we have different types of refugees and uh, uh, these are some of the refugees that we may say unsung refugees that die in silence because they are not protected. So, but the UK government under the immigration law accepts and protects those people that are really in danger of their lives. From my experience in my work, there've been so many people that we have assisted in that area that are refugees, not because they're running away from war, but because they're running, their lives are in danger or their children's lives are in danger. The majority, of course, are those from conflict um, countries where there's war and uh, um, where it is very difficult to leave because of certain circumstances. So, but I just wanted you to know that, that, uh, you know, um, there are so many types of refugees. Um, of course, you'd be surprised if I tell you that we've dealt with refugees from the United States of America. You'd be surprised. But these are some of the uh, stories about immigration in relation to um, refugees. Now, coming to spouses and unmarried partners. This is another area of um, um, immigration that is very critical, especially to people like um, you who are very, um, who are engineers, because normally sometimes you get married to um, somebody who, who is from who is a British and you want to come to the UK, um, you would obviously seek for advice on what are the requirements uh, that you have to meet uh, for you to come in this country as a spouse or a partner of uh, somebody who is settled here or who is British. So for a spouse visa, I'll give you um, brief summary of what are the requirements for you to come and join your spouse here in the UK or your partner and married partner. First, I'll start with a spouse, which also falls in the same category of a fiance visa. All these visas that I've been talking about, they have somehow been affected by COVID-19. However, after the, um, the lockdown was lifted, these again, they, um, they, were, they went back to the status quo. Now, in terms of the uh, spouse visa, if you want to come to the UK and you are married to somebody who is British or settled in the UK or somebody who is on um, tier two visa or tier four visa, you can come to us and we, again, we advise you on that. Uh, because there's so many visas here, but I'll try to speak on a spouse visa based on a student, somebody who is um, studying here and wants to bring the wife or husband. If you are studying, you've got the scholarship to study in the UK, you can bring your spouse here. The reason why it is um, inevitable is that because you're going to be studying here for a longer period of time. If you are studying for a shorter period of time, you may find challenges because it may not be reasonable for you to bring your wife. If you are maybe going to be studying, you're going to be studying here for only two months or three months. But if you're coming here, for example, one year master's degree, one year plus, you can bring your wife or your husband or your partner. And if you're studying for uh, three year a PhD program, you can do that. You can bring that. But these, for students, it's actually much easier because you have the institution also to provide a supporting letter. Sometimes the institute assists you to do that because they've got a department of immigration in most of these universities, learning institutions. But where you don't have access to that, you can always get in touch with us I've put my phone number there and will be able to assist you. 
For a spouse visa, what they want to know first is that there is a genuine and subsisting relationship between you and your partner. Now, for genuine and subsisting relationship, what they require is that you must demonstrate that if you are married, that you have a marriage certificate. It's very, the standards are very high if you are unmarried, unmarried partner. But if you're married, you provide your marriage certificate, also provide, um, because what they want to ensure is that you, when you got married, you met in person. So they will insist that you provide photographs, wedding photographs, and that maybe if they are witnesses, family and friends photographs. Normally it's ideal to provide not less than 10 photographs. Of course, somebody's gonna tell you, I only provided two and I was granted. It depends on the caseworker. But normally, to be on the safe side, if you provide 10 to 12 photographs, it will show that you, are, you, you actually met in person. Now, to show that you're in a subsisting, again, relationship, you need to show that you've been communicating. So to show that you've been communicating, it depends the period that you've been here yourself. If you've been here for six months, at least provide uh, evidence of communication for six months. One thing I would just age everybody who wanna come and you know, in that way, that when you come over to the UK, don't throw away your letters. Don't throw away any communication that you get. Get a box and throw them in a box because you need them at some point. So you provide evidence that you've been communicating with your spouse or partner. That is, for example, chats. You can print those chats, WhatsApp chats, if you're using WhatsApp, today is the most common way. If you use emails, you should print the emails at least you know, for six months emails to show that, or WhatsApp, to show that you've been communicating. There's that kind of relationship. Rather than, you know, if you don't provide that, you may be considered to be in a sham marriage. And again, um, if you are sending money to your partner, you can provide also uh, money transfer uh, receipts, or if you're using the bank, you provide the bank and just, you know, um, indicate or highlight those transactions that you've been doing. So that shows, so you need to show that you, there's subsisting relationship, and then there is also communication and there's financial support. And uh, also that you are resident here and the type of visa you have, you need to provide that. So what to happen for the spouse visa is that except for students, normally it's, it's, it's very easy for students to get your spouse in here because you are not subjected to a lot of scrutiny because the school gets involved, your institution gets involved as compared to non-students. If a non-student and your, your partner is here, the scrutiny is very high. And uh, because they want to make sure that this is a genuine uh, relationship. And now the other point that is very critical to all spouse visas is that you need to meet the financial requirement. Right now, it stands at 18,600. Now for students, it's a little bit different because you need to have a certain amount of money in the bank account for some, it will be nine months, some, it could be even um, less, but you need to have a certain amount in your account for a number of months for you to bring your, um, your partner. But if you are not a student, you need to meet 18,600 per year. It doesn't mean that you should be earning 18,000 every month, no, 18,600 per year. That's the current fee. But you also need to pay the immigration health surcharge. For student again, it's a little bit different and lower because your fees, the fees for the students is lower. But for regular, for any, for any other person who's not a student, at the moment we are still standing at 1000 immigration health surcharge. So the total fee at the moment is going to 2056 pound 20. Now all these fees fluctuate and change. So this can change. When you, you provide that, then you fill the application online. Normally the application online is all about you. And they'll ask you when you met the person and so forth, when you met each other and all those things which are very private and confidential. 
so you can fill in that application. However, if you have any challenges doing that, you can always email us. We're ready to assist. And then um, I also want to talk about a married partners. This is one area most of the people uh, from um, BMEs are not aware of, that when you live with a person for more than two years, two and a half years outside the country as your partner, you can also invite them to come to the UK and join them because you have lived together outside the country for more than two and a half years as unmarried partner. All you need to do is provide evidence that you live together. Of course, there are correspondence that you can use to demonstrate that you live together outside the United Kingdom. So the other requirements are the same, photographs, communication, financial support, um, accommodation, that you have enough accommodation, it will not be overcrowding when they come and join you here. And then let me just go quickly again to the other family members and dependents. Again, you have to demonstrate in this in order to bring other family members like your children, or if you've been living with your niece, or you've been living with your sibling who is young and uh, they are under the age of 18, or they are even over the age of 18, but they have got uh, challenges, maybe physical challenges that are long term, then you can also come with them, as long as you can demonstrate that they were part of your household when you lived outside the United Kingdom. Now, um, <clears throat> Uh, I've already talked about that, you know, that uh, you need to have to meet those financial requirements, for example, uh, where you have to provide your bank statement, pay slips, and, you know, those uh, contracts, those are the employment uh, documents that they require. They are very simple. Letter from the employer, um, contract of employment, pay slips for six months, bank states for six months. There is a joke I always joke with my colleagues when I were working, said uh, one of the clients came to our place and um, wanted to make an application to bring the wife. And uh, he had five pay slips and six bank statements. And the home office refused the application because we told him you need to have six pay slips and six months pay slips and six months pay bank statements, but he had only uh, five months. And because he was not active enough to go and pick the other bank statement from work, uh, the other pay slip to make six, so they refused the application, which costed him over 3,000 pounds. Now, why I'm saying this is that these requirements that I've said, they are very simple to find and to get. You can do that. But if you miss one of them saying no, because I, I can't find it, then don't do it because they will refuse. The caseworker has a ticking box. They will just tick this six months bank statement, six months per slips, and then a letter from the employer. A letter from the employer is different than the uh, contract of employment because the letter from the employer will state when you started work, how much you get paid, what type of job you do, whether it's uh, part-time or full-time or Uh, Mr. Lazarus, you've been muted. So you can you unmute yourself? Is uh, we can't we can't Somebody, hear you. Sorry, right. sorry, sorry. I was I don't know how I got muted. Um, <clears throat> so um, in that case, I was just talking about that. Now coming to the student student visa, there are a lot of people who want to apply to come and study in the UK. And when it comes to the student visa, these student visas, they are also normally connected to the, um, the university or the learning institution where you're coming. Once you're accepted, then normally the school will assist you with that. If they don't assist you, again, you can always call us. I've given the number they have given my email address and will assist you to provide you with the um, requirements because we'll 
we'll, we'll do our investigation according to which investor you're going to, and then we can assist you in that. Normally, it's very rare that we have um, students with those challenges. The only time the student mostly come to us is when they are within the UK and they want to renew their visa. There are times when you as a student, you have not completed your studies for reasons beyond your control or for, because of certain exceptional circumstances, then you are unable to complete, then you can always come to us and we'll advise you. However, I can't explain more on this because each student will have a different um, situation if they have to proceed with their stay in the UK to apply for further leave to remain. And most of them, the, uh, most, of us, most of the students get uh, the challenges when they are in a relationship in the UK or they have not completed their, um, they have not completed their course because of those reasons. And uh, because, um, you know, maybe they were sick, then they, they would come to us and say, look, I was sick. Sometimes the investor will not be able to understand their challenges. Then that's where we come in and also demonstrate by law that they should be able to extend their visa. We've had so many students that have gone through this, especially when they meet challenges of not completing their studies in time. Thanks a lot. And as a result, for example, recently of the COVID-19, it's been, uh, it's become, we've got so many students that have come forth because of those challenges of not completing their courses. And, uh, you know, because some of the students have had challenges uh, with the uh, connections of internet and all that stuff. It's just been so difficult, especially when we had the lockdown. And most, and then the other group of students that we deal with also are those that are in relationship with British nationals or people that are settled in the UK or are in relationship with the EU nationals. So they also come to us and we assist them because when you're a student, these are some of the visas that are um, allow, visit visa you're not allowed to marry, but when you're a student, you can get married if you met somebody. So this is, this is the visa that we have with so many people that are in this situation. The reason is some people want to do these visas, uh, if they get married, they want to do the visa on their own. We've had so many, again, people who did a DIY, do it yourself, um, on these applications because they did not meet the requirements, then they refused the application. And some of them have been told to leave the country. So um, it's very, very important for, if you want to apply for further leave to remain as a student who assist. And if you have a challenge or when you have already got a place and you have a challenge to get the visa, you can get in touch with us. But I can't explain more on this because it's a unique, different uh, challenges. Now, we, we, with the students again, um, we just have had, um, you know, a lot of uh, writings from the Home Office about the point-based system uh, that is um, going to be also uh, introduced to students that are coming from the EA Nationals and uh, what this point-based system, so far at the moment, this has not yet been implemented in such a way that we have those students until the UK leaves the EU. We haven't had, we haven't started this point based system for EU nationals. We have continued with the point based system um, as it as a status quo. But there is some writings that we've received through from the immigration stating that they will reduce some of the fees, you know, and uh, the um, the of uh, the fees uh, based on point based system. Um, I'm sure it's because they want to accommodate a bigger number of people from the EU nationals who would not be able to meet those fees, which would be actually a plus for people from non-EU non EU countries because now that will, that will include that. It's the same uh, with um, the fees, um, the, the financial requirement for married, for spouse visas and partners,
Right. Sorry, again, I, I was I was muted. I don't know. It's just doing it um, automatically. Yes, sir. If yes, doctor. Have you about time? I think if you can maybe wrap up now. Let me just time. wrap up quickly. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. I um... they have some questions. I think. Okay. I've just talked about visit visa. That's why I wanted to spend a bit of time there talking about the spouse visa, and civil partner is the same way like. Uh, you know, um, spouse visa, fiance visa. The fiance visa, there are two types of vis visas. There's one which is called marriage visa and the fiance visa. Marriage visa is six months. And after you get married in the UK, then you can go back. You don't need to meet the financial requirements when you come on it. Uh, marriage visa is the same requirements as a visit visa, except that when you come on a fiance, on a, um, marriage visa you come and get married so you get married and then you go back to your country and apply for a spouse visa fiance visa when you come on it you stay in the country you come on a fiance visa and you meet the spouse visa and partner visa requirements the 18,600 you meet that so i've talked about that point-based system Point-based system is that it means that they are, this is on tier, it comes on tier four for students, they are point-based system and tier two. Now these tier two point-based system, it means that they have set up points that you have to meet in order for you to qualify to come to meet the requirements. The points they would say, for example, if you have this amount of money, it means you've got this point. Another, you know, you, you are able to demonstrate that you'll be able to look after yourself, another point. So this is how they have done the point-based system. But all these are specific to individual applications. So if, unless there's a specific application, okay? So um, we just talked about why um, people come here. So holiday visa is similar to the visit visa except the holiday visa, you don't say I'm going to visit some, somebody, you come for holiday, you're gonna stay in the hotel. So the requirement, one of the different requirements is that you provide the uh, itinerary and you provide the booking that you've done in the UK where you're going to stay, okay. Okay, now um, what I'll do again is that since we are running out of time, I think uh, is that um, I wanted to see that I, I hope Emmanuel you'll be able to check this so that um, the everybody can uh, can have a copy so that they can be able to see these are uh, for example here we're talking about um, countries okay. uh, that are uh, visa countries and non-visa countries okay right. visa nations Okay, and non visa nations. So, visa nations are the countries where you need a visa to come into the UK. Okay, yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. We're running a poll just to see, to get ideas on what people think about the timing. Uh, but okay, that's fine. Okay. Uh, can go okay. <laughs> so okay, just for timing. three minutes, just yeah. talk about naturalization if that's okay. Uh, okay, now to remove this uh, close. Okay. okay, now the last part I want to talk about is naturalization. Okay, um, <clears throat> if you the before I talk about naturalization, allow me to speak about long term. Uh, the students that have been here and they have lived here for more than ten years as students or and worked and so forth. Because as a student, when you come as a student, you cannot apply for indefinite leave to remain after five years. The only way you can do is when you change your visa, if you change your visa to a spouse visa or tier two, then after five years, you may think of maybe applying for indefinite leave to remain. But 90% of the students that have lived here, they have applied for indefinite leave to remain after 10 years, long for residence in the UK. So if you've stayed here for 10 years, long for resident, then the current law states that you can apply for indefinite leave to remain. And we are ready to help you with that. 
because all you need to do is to provide evidence that you've lived here for 10 years, a lawful residence, and then you can apply for that. And we have assisted a lot of students who have done that. The next one, which is very important for all of you is the post-study visa, visa that has been introduced that after you finish your studies, you can still stay here and work for the next two years. I think I'll leave it on there. Sorry, doctor, for taking too much time. Oh, no problem at all. Thank you very much once again for uh, this very comprehensive talk. I, I must say that um, Mr. Lazarus had arranged a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Before now, we've talked about this together and we'll make, the, we'll make the slides available. He's graciously accepted to make it available to everyone, including several links that you can use to assess most of these uh, information and other things you want to do. Uh, also, just to say that, yeah, we ran over the time, but with the poll that I just uh, launched, about 86% of all respondents agreed that we, we can go for another 10, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. So. I was just going to say you're up finally, but I think we would have many questions. So it's it's good that we have uh, the remaining time left uh, for, for the questions. Again, Thank I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Engineer Sharp, to handle the question and answer session. And I really want to thank you once again for this presentation, Mr. Lazarus. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Lazarus. Yes, yes uh, thank you. Thank you. Just to read out a, a question here, and then we can take it from there. Um, quite a few questions here already. That's great. Uh, mm -hmm. For someone who's got his one year uh, doctoral extension program on that tier four visa, uh, that meaning he's got after a PhD program and have started working as a full time lecturer already, uh, almost a year before getting his uh, tier two sponsorship visa, can that person add the one year spent as a lecturer during his doctoral extension program to the five statutory years to apply for indefinite leave to remain? Uh, thank you so much. Um, your question is very relevant that, uh, you know, the person has got one year doctoral uh, uh, study visa, and then um, can he add it to the five years? Uh, the, the, that is not possible because unless he has a tier two visa, so tier four does not um, account for the five-year route. So if he's on tier four, unless he changed to tier, tier two, but when he changes to tier two, he has to be on tier two for, for, for five years. But this only adds on to the 10-year route. Okay, tier four would add to the 10-year route. No, but, okay. no. Tier four would not, yeah, tier four will add to the 10-year route, not, uh, yes, correct, yeah. Okay, but he cannot add it to the- uh, Tier two, uh, no. Tier two to become five, five no. years route, no. okay. Now, someone is asking, can you explain how the global talent visa works, briefly? The global? Talent visa. Talent, yes. oh, the talent visa, which is tier five. Yeah. It, okay. Are you talking about the tier five? Yes. Yeah, okay. Global talent visa. How okay. No, that global is it the one, the one they are introducing is the talent visa right now. Okay. okay. There I is the yeah there is that's the one they are introducing the two year postgraduate visa. Go ahead, sir. The postgraduate uh, visa that is for two years. So after you fin you graduated, then you can apply to stay in the UK, especially those that will be graduating after the law has been passed will be able to stay in the UK for the next two years and work once they get a job, okay? But the, the most important thing is for you to get a job and you can get that visa. Uh, and they have reduced the amount of money that is required for tier two, which is a good, it's a plus. Before it was 35,000 per year, the company should be able to say that you'll be earning 35,000 pounds, but now it's 25. So it's easier that way that you can, most of the companies will be able to pay you 25,000 with your qualification. So you can work for two years, okay? And what, what that gives is an opportunity for you. They have not said it's not a renewable visa. If you get a job, then the company sponsors you, then you can stay even after two years. 
unless you don't get any sponsor, then you can leave. At least you've got your experience. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Lazarus. Now, one more question here uh, quickly. Is it possible uh, for, for those who, in terms of where the wedding, wedding get married in church and get a spousal visa without wedding in court? So uh, does wedding in church without wedding in court, can you uh, use that for spousal visa? Um, that's a very interesting one. I'll tell you one thing before I answer that question. Uh, right now, we still have Article 8. Article 8 is family and private life. So um, what that one works is that um, you cannot get a spouse visa if that marriage was done here in the UK in the church. But you can get another visa if you have children and other exceptional circumstances in your relationship. You can apply for family and private life. But for the spouse visa, if the marriage was done in church here in the UK, it's not recognized. The only church marriage that is recognized if it was done in another country in Africa or in anywhere else where the government accept that kind of marriage, then you can use it. You can apply for a spouse visa. Okay. If, for example, in Zambia or Nigeria, the uh, government recognizes church marriage, like in most of Muslim countries, they accept marriage uh, through the, uh, um, the church, the mosque in other countries. So that is accepted here except if you do the marriage here in the UK in the mosque, it will not be accepted or in the Catholic church or in the, any other Christian church. It will not be accepted or will be accepted? It will not be accepted. Okay. So you cannot apply for a spouse visa unless it's recognized by the government. That marriage is recognized by the government. Normally what they do with the marriages that are recognized by the government through the church is that first you register, you go and register with the council then they will, uh, and sometimes they will take you to the home office to do the interviews. Sometimes the council will do it for you because immediately you go to the council to register your marriage, they will communicate directly to the home office to check whether you have the, you have the right to stay in the UK. Right. <clears throat> Someone is saying global talent visa is a visa to work in the UK if you are a potential leader in one of the following areas, academic, digital technology, arts and culture. Uh, I think it's um, more or less uh, the upgrade of the entrepreneur. Uh, let me hear your comment on that. What, what, yeah, what they do with those kind of, that kind of visa of talent is that you have exceptional talent that you have. We also deal with those kind of visas. We've had a lot of people in that. Um, if you have exceptional, talent. These exceptional talents are those talents that are, you know, are, are not there. You know, um, I still remember one of my client was from Virgin Media, was a computer um, uh, programmer. And uh, the company stated very clearly that we need this person because of his talent that he has. So those are some of the talents that they will do. It's very easy, for example, if, for example, if you have a PhD, and that PhD is in a very special, you know, it's a special program that is needed in the UK, they would consider that kind of visa to grant you under that. But the standards are just too high for that. Would you, would you which tier would you put that? Which tier does it come under? Tier. It, oh, that wow. will come under the um, tier. Normally we used to have that on tier one, but I think for now, um, that visa is, 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 is a very complicated, complex one, and it's very rare that they'll give you, unless the university is able to give you that job. And uh, if you get that job, you definitely get a visa. If the institution or a scientific research center gives you that job, they will give you. There are a lot of, there's one student who came from Glasgow University. She was doing a PhD there, and when she finished, she approached us and she was given a job in England, one of the universities as a lecturer. And she approached us and the investors also supported and she was given the visa. 
Thank you very much. Just on a, a, a concluding note, can you throw more light on the promising and the upcoming uh, visa, uh, post-study visa that the government is uh, rolling out? That's a very interesting one, actually. You know, we used to have post-study visa in the UK um, until uh, I think 20, 2012 or so. That's when they stopped it. So this is coming back you know, and uh, it, it, I, um, because everything, we, they have sent us the email to say that it's coming up. Normally there are certain things that just write online, which don't even carry weight. But uh, when they write to us, for, to our institution, to the lawyers, um, then we know the immigration lawyers, then we know that this is gonna be passed as a law. Uh, so uh, that one, I can promise you is gonna be there, but the burden of proof lies on each student to find a job also. Because if you don't find a job for two years and you've got that visa, then you can't even renew it. So okay. that is going what, to be done. I, I think what would be necessary at this stage before we get to the two years before is what would the one just to prove that you've studied a course for six months or one year or to qualify for the two years post study. What, what does it mean? What does it require? It's required that you've graduated. Graduate in summer next year. Yes. <laughs> you've graduated. Not when you come for six months, no. You must have come graduated for a master's a bachelor's degree. Or master's. Okay. You must have done a bachelor's or a master's, a postgraduate degree. Okay. Not where you just do a one year course and no. At least, you know, the, the whole purpose of this is that to return the skills to get the people that have been trained here to contribute to the economy of this country in the way they are going to contribute as people that have learned. You're not going to, you know, it's not like when you finish and then um, a three, six months diploma or one uh, less, than, less than one year or six months degree, then they can give you a post, post uh, graduate degree, um, post study visa. But at the same time, this is why lawyers come in because they have never been very clear in the way they defined it. So we can always assist you because we'll look into that and say, and then we can argue on the point of law. Say, this is what you wrote and this is what we're saying. So within the law, until they make it very clear on what they mean and their definition, then you can say there's no way I can work it out. But because they have not done it very clearly, then we can look into that. But <clears throat> Their notion is based on the fact that you need to have a degree that you have done here. Even previously, I'm sure I just copy, mostly copy and paste from what used to be there before, that um, they retained skilled uh, students, students that graduated with a degree and also postgraduate. Thank you, thank you. Finally, that's the final question from my end before we close this. If someone is resident in the UK, uh, qualify with all that, how can he has a kid or a child that is uh, outside the UK? Quick advice on how you can bring the person over. If you are in the UK, you are settled here, or are you set? If somebody is settled, it's got settled, uh, yeah. cool settled or he's got tier, tier two visa, or yeah. he is British, or he's married to a British, they can bring the child here. So if let's say you, you come to the UK and marry somebody in the UK, you have a child out there, you can bring your child here. As long as you are, you are on tier two, you are, on, um, you are a settled person here, you're on definite leave to remain, or you're married to a British. The only visa that you can't bring somebody here is if you have a limited discretionary leave to remain. It will be very difficult for you to bring somebody here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Dr. Emmanuel. Uh, thank you. Thank Master. you very much. Thanks a lot for, for these interactions. I think these things are uh, quite... um, Yes, sorry, man. Uh, just a couple of uh, comments on the on the chat box. I think you know, people are pointing out that the, the global talent visa is now very easy. There is no more difficult visa to process. In case if you have anyone on the on the platform now that is looking to apply for that. I think the process is now really easy. Just one of the- um, Just on that same one, 
Do you have some evidence on that? Yeah, I think we we have people that you know they they are PhD, they you know they have doctorate and they confirm that they are they have some colleagues that recently applied for that. So I think the because a few people have applied, few people that put the child, but they are all PhD holders. I have the Dr. P from Imperial College. I have um, Dr. P. Akubo, it's, one of our members from the, mm -hmm. a, a, as it's well. It's very so, good, yeah, if they can share that information with the rest of the people that are attending the meeting. So yeah. that, that would help. Because yeah. you see um, what they do with this um, immigration, they, they will change certain things that they don't communicate with the rest of the, uh, um, the, the stakeholders. Yeah, but if yeah. you can come across that, it's better to share that information yeah, with everybody. Yeah, yeah, and thank you. I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm and just. And if somebody has any challenge, you can still assist. Yeah. Because yeah, that's uh, yeah. the area that we would be interested yeah. to know. I mean, the, the good news is, I mean, yourself, you provided us your details and all that. People will share you with the people on the platform so they can contact you at any time when as is required. Um, I will just go back. I will let um, Dr. Emmanuel Sari to you. continue with the, as he's moderating to close the program. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. We've gone really far beyond the, the close time. I was just going to say the, the situation are quite nuanced for each person because the, the thing with visa applications is uh, people are coming with different uh, requirements or different achievements. So you can't really put everyone in a box in different forms. And this is why you, it's, it's good to, to communicate with uh, the immigration lawyers like uh, Mr. Lazarus and other people who can assist. And those who have done it to also share ideas of how they've gone, they've gone through it. You, know, you might have all the requirements already, but not assessing the right information might make it look like it's a bit complicated or not and things like that. So thanks very much again, Mr. Lazarus, for your presentation and interaction and the time spent with us. And uh, I really hope that lots of people will have gained so many things from this and it's just starting up conversations in this area just to show that the NSC Glasgow is not all about technical engineering or things like that. We also offer this kind of support and, and help for members who are going through certain things that need uh, to be linked up to support and help from for, for immigration related uh, 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 related stuff. We can help with that. I'm just trying to talk so fast so we can finish this quickly since we're taking so much time. So I'm just going to give 30 seconds each to our speakers, if you don't mind, please, for just some final words, if you have anything else to say. I think Professor Alison Phipps is still on. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. It's my absolute pleasure. And I wanted to say thank you so much to Lazarus for such a full and comprehensive, detailed and accurate um, overview of all the very many issues of visas facing any migrant in the country at the moment, especially um, the, the repeating that anybody has the right to claim asylum. This isn't a route to migration, it is a right to life. And it is so often forgotten. Um, so I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed that. And again, just really commend the Ethnic, law, um, the, the ethnic um, and Minority Law Centre to, to you all. Um, and, and to say, you know, that it's a really moving day. I will always remember that when I heard the news, that the 45th president of the United States had been replaced by a 46th, um, and that um, rightly people were either bursting out singing or bursting into tears, that I was amongst friends and amongst my people, and that we um, could feel that sense of hope and justice. So I want to thank you all for your work and for making your home with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. What a very uh, good note to end it. <laughs> and indeed, a memorable and historic one there. Uh, hopefully, we'll be getting back to you again, Professor F uh, uh, Phipps, for uh, more of the discussion, especially how we as the NSC in Glasgow, in London, in Manchester, and all of the branches here can uh, participate in your work and also uh, support and benefit our members uh, far away from here. So Mr. Lazarus, just final words, 30 seconds, if you don't mind, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. I just want to say again to Dr. Phipps, Alison, that uh, I would really want to have your contacts because you have a lot of people that come in that may need our uh, services and sometimes they don't know where to find us. So this would be um, not the end, but the beginning. And uh, I'll communicate the information to the EMLC. 
Otherwise, I'm so grateful to be part of this successful story, to see so many people from Africa, you know, um, to come on today. It's just an amazing. And, uh, you know, this is something that has really taught me, like Dr. Phipps has talked about connecting this, um, the solving of the problems with the academia. Yeah. Thank just you. for everybody to know, um, I just registered my political party in Zambia. So um, I'll be participating in the 2021 elections. Um, yes. So just watch my space, I'll be there. Thank you so much. It's called right. Zambians United for Sustainable Development. Thank you. It was registered on the 2nd of November this year. Thank you so yeah. much. This is yeah. Yeah, fantastic. We will, we will keep eyes on Zambia. I'm, I'm sure that you will not reject our invitation by that time. I will, anytime, <laughs> actually, very soon. Yeah, thank you. All right, so. thank you. <laughs> very, very best wishes on your political career uh, uh, in the future. I mean, we're celebrating news from an election today, uh, celebrating democracy. So hopefully, you also gain from the democracy in Zambia and contribute positively to. The development and we encourage our members to get into politics get into the policy making get into the board where decisions are made um, we need people in the technical but we also need people in in active politics and policy making like this so that our decisions and uh, our, our worries and concerns can also be brought to the forefront as required so i'll just invite quickly our technical uh, secretary engineer fiverr for a vote of thanks and quick announcements one minute sir <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you, Engineer Saliso. Um, uh, so yes, um, I would like to um, extend our deep appreciation on behalf of um, the NSC Glasgow branch to both speakers. Um, we've definitely um, learned a lot and had to reflect a lot from your presentation. Um, I can see the opportunities um, in, in the areas of um, applying some of the processes back home in Nigeria to encourage um, en encourage um, cultural diversity and leverage on the benefits of our ethnic diversity. And also, on the other hand, we've also got a great resource here in Glasgow that we could use going forward for migration. Um, issues or any questions we've got. So thank you both. And like my colleagues have said, we hope we'll see you um, next time uh, or in the not too distant future rather. Um, so um, in general size, so please, if you move over to the next slide, we've got a few announcements to make. Um, so there are lots of events coming up. So we've just selected a few of them and we'll share the rest via the various forums. So on the um, 19th of November, we've got the Nigerian Society of Engineers annual general meeting for 2020. So we are calling on all members to please um, endeavor to attend. Um, yes, next slide, please. Um, also, um, the Glasgow branch, NSE Glasgow branch, we've got our next um, meeting, which is on the 21st of November, 5 p.m. UK time. And also um, in December, we've got our next uh, webinar series, which is more of a training workshop on the key fundamentals of CAD for beginners and experts. Uh, this will be covered by our very own um, engineer, Sharp Ugocha, who is a member of the executive executive committee and it's coming on the 7th of December. So thank you everyone and also thanks to the um, invited guests for making it and please watch the space for the upcoming events we're going to be having for the rest of this year and also our plans for next year. If you've got any inquiries or for those of us who have questions that were not answered, we want to follow up, um, you can please use our contact details shown, which is contact at nsclasgo.org.uk. And you can also contact some of the presenters directly via the um, contact information on the webinar advert. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great night and enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Oh, th Bye. Th thank you. Bye. Thanks, thank everyone. So all, thank all right. Thank you very much. Thank Good night. You. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.
Hi, hi, Lazarus. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Slides and some other links will be shared. Thank you. Emails that we have. Thank you very much. Be sent to everyone via email. Thank you. Thank you.